comes from the Gospel according to Luke, beginning at chapter 15, verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will be to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the paws that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran out and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen. For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never even given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then his father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life, he was lost and has been found. The word of the Lord. Has has anyone seen Grace? I was hoping she'd be here by now, but, well, to be honest, I heard that there was a party being thrown nearby, and, well, you know how Grace is. She can't resist a party. No, you know, she's not invited, I might add. No, I'm afraid that's where you'll find grace this morning. Now, I don't want to judge another's actions, but, well, I'm really glad you didn't accept that invitation and came here instead. You do know this party is well done. Well, I'm glad you came here, because what could be more morning with a group of fellow (laughs) uh, the church of elders you do know the word Presbyterian means elder Presbyterian church is the church of the elders well anyways oh yeah I'm very glad you didn't go to this party and I don't mind telling you why it seems this family, and I won't mention names, had a, a horrible falling out a while back. Seems the younger son just demanded his inheritance from his father, just wished his father dead, in essence. And amazingly, the father agreed. And this younger son, half of his wealth, the, all of all the son's inheritance. And then just a few days later, this younger son just up and leaves. No word of thanks, no word where he's going. He just took off. 
with his inheritance. A father scrimps and saves his whole life. He makes all the sacrifices a parent makes for a child. And this younger son squanders his entire inheritance, half his father's wealth, in just a short while in wild living. Disgraceful. Well, not long after this, as you all know, the economy tanked. <laughs> and this son was left without a penny, without a friend, and without a way to make a living. He ended up on the streets having to beg for his food. And finally, he came to himself, right? And, and realized what he had done. And yeah, that's, that's typical, isn't it? You know, it's only after we lose what we had that we appreciate it, or in this case, squander it away before we realize just how blessed we really are. So anyways, this son decides he's going to return home. So he makes up a little speech. He, he's going to tell his father he has sinned before heaven and him, and, and uh, he's not worthy to be called a son. He will work as a hired servant. So maybe, maybe over time he can earn his father's love back, but at least in the meantime, he won't, he won't starve to death. And this is where the story, this is where Grace really loves this story. All right. The son hitchhikes home. And he starts that long walk down from the gate to the house. And his father happened to, you know, was in the house, happened to look out the window and saw this son walking back up the drive. And the father just lost it. He just lost it. I mean, he just dropped whatever he was doing. He just ran, screaming down the steps, out the door, just like a madman. And the son, about half mad father coming out after him. But before he could do anything, his father reached him, and he threw his arms around, tears running out his eyes, kissed him. The son was back. The son who was dead is alive. He was lost. He's now found. Well... The son, you know, somewhat taken aback, kind of nevertheless regrouped and launched into his speech, right? He had that little prepared speech, and, Father, I have sinned before heaven and you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. And, and this is the part of the story I think Grace loved best. The father would have nothing to do with his son's confession. He just brushed it aside like, like he brushed away a pesky fly. Instead, he called his servants. He goes, get, get, let's get my son's clothes. Look at these in rags. Get his best clothes. Kill the, kill the fatted calf. We are going to have one party. That's where Grace is now. Guarantee it. Right? And she just loves the part where the father wouldn't even listen to the son's confession, his offer of atonement. Grace feels that's how a father's love should be unconditional. It cannot be earned, and it cannot be lost, even when that child spurns that love. But Grace is missing the point, isn't she? Right? Grace seems to have forgotten that this father had two sons. He had a younger son that spurned his love and disgraced the family, but he also had an elder son who did neither. His elder son had faced all the same temptations as the younger son to leave, had all the same frustrations about being stuck on the family farm, all the worlds out there calling. But the elder son remained loyal. He stayed and did the bidding of the father, while the younger son disgraced the family and squandered his inheritance. And now this elder son, who has done the management and managed the family farm, done the back-breaking labor of bringing in the harvest, is just supposed to stand by while this low life comes back into the family, probably just to live off the labor of others again. Who do you think raised that prized calf they killed for this party? You got it. It was the elder son and more. And now he's just supposed to supposed to join a party and welcome this parasite back into the family? Oh, no, Grace just doesn't understand, does she? But we do. We know, right? There, there has to be some 
some act of atonement of the, of the younger son's sins against the father, the whole thing is just, just a farce, right? And, but wait a minute, right? The, the younger son had been willing to admit his sin. He had been willing to do acts of atonement. The problem was the father. The father was too quick to forgive. The father should have withheld forgiveness until he was sure that the younger son had reformed and wouldn't just do the same thing over again. That would have been the loving course of action, right? And this course of action would have had the benefit of, of not offending the, the elder son who would have remained, remained loyal. Well, no, actually the elder son probably still would have been ticked, but it would have made it a little more palatable, right? Because after all, such an arrangement would have made the elder son the boss of the younger son, and that, that would have had some appeal, and certainly would have been a lesson the younger son never would have forgotten. But instead, the father won't even listen to the son's offer of atonement and, and throws a party to welcome his return. Well, no wonder the elder son won't go to this party. It is an insult to him and all his years of faithful service to the father. And, and the worst part is this. He explained all of this to the father. And the father still went to this party to welcome the younger son, even if the eldest son wouldn't go. Well, I say we stand with the elder son, all right? After all, we refuse to go to this party. After all, we are the Presbyterian church, the church of the elders, right? The elder sons and daughters. We must stand with the Son. Forgiveness needs to be withheld, right? Until those who have sinned admit their sin, make proper acts of atonement, and, 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 and then, and then, we will gladly welcome them back into our family. Oh, I know what Grace would say to that. She drives me nuts sometimes. Grace would have you believe that withheld forgiveness is just, is just a, an act of, of, of moral coercion that tries to force people to outwardly conform to our expectations of them when forgiveness really should all be all about freeing people from their debts so that they can willingly change. Can you believe that? It drives me nuts sometimes. Grace would have you believe that forgiveness can actually precede repentance and foster it. She, she drives me nuts. Stuff. Where did she come up with it? I want to hear Grace say that with forgiveness, celibate forgiveness, it has no reproductive power. Uh, I, I swear she... I, I, I swear Grace... or not, they ever made an act. Well, it's a good thing we are the Presbyterian Church, right? The Church of Elders. And we might be part right now. Ugh, just. And yet, grace, isn't there? I, something to me, I have to admit, Yes, yes, it, it, the elder son didn't quite get the story right. Yes, he did. He had explained to the father about how this party was an insult to him, and his father still went ahead with this party for the elder son. But, but what the elder son just didn't realize, didn't see, didn't admit, but what Grace was quick to point out to me was that the father actually went looking the elder son. Think about it. I mean, 
he was obviously longing for his younger son to return, but he never sought him out. But when this elder son who had always been with him refused to come to the party, the father sought him out. The father pled with him to come to the party. He never sought out the younger son. He never pled for him to return. Grace explained it, she explained it to me this way. Both sons, both the elder son and the younger son, had spurned the love of the father because both believed that the father's love could be earned. The younger son at least understood he had sinned against his in heaven and his father, even if he didn't understand completely how, but not so the elder. The elder son believed that his years of faithful service had earned his father's love. And so he was uh, enraged when the father welcomed the younger son back without an act of atonement. But, but this is what grace understands so well, and what so Father loves his children because they are his children. He loved them before they were even born. Grace had it right all along. The Father's love, no, it cannot be earned, be lost. You see, we, um, elder sons and daughters of the faith who have remained and done the work have the story half right. Yes, if you spurn our Father's love and, and, and go off and then later realize your sin and come back, the Father will welcome you back with open arms. Just look how he's welcomed back this youngest son who blew half his wealth. But what happens if you never admit your sin, or worse yet, what if you never even realize you are a sinner because of your self-righteousness? Well, in that case, grace assures us the Father will seek you out. He will come looking for you, not to punish you, not to drag you to this party, but to forgive you even of your own self-righteousness and to make sure you know that the door to this celebration remains open for you. Friends, this door is open even now. And grace stands at that door beckoning for you and I to join. But grace is quick to point out, though, none of us are invited to the celebration because we are worthy. We are invited because we are loved by the Father. Let all God's people say,